Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. So on today's episode, we're going to be looking at making yoga meaningful and getting yoga off the mat and into life. This episode applies to uh, anyone who has any kind of mat-based practice, actually. It might be uh, martial arts or kung fu or anything else. We're looking at the principles of adding depth and meaning to practice and the principles of getting it off the mat. This is really one of my specialisms. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. I'm ahead of then a bit of an update on the podcast. So podcast going great. We've had thousands of downloads. It's got a fancy new home at embodiedfacilitator.com. You'll see at the top there a little thing that says podcast. So if you want to uh, see some pictures of people, get the links to different things we're talking about, that's the place to go. Um, it's a nice way to share it, nice presentation there. Yeah, it's been interesting looking at the stats in terms of where people are from. So about a third of our viewers are from the UK. Um, the US is the next biggest group, and then there's a bunch of countries after that. Uh, US, uh, I mentioned Russia, Canada, Netherlands, Australia, Germany all get pretty good listens. Some from France, Switzerland, Norway. So pretty spread out, you guys are, which is very cool. Um, we have over 50 guests booked, so that's pretty incredible. I've been, uh, my secretary Aggie's been working really hard on that. Um, we've got uh, people coming on from all all kinds of disciplines i mean it's it's pretty ridiculous and if you feel like you know something you do isn't represented then uh, let me know you know if, if you want to get someone i was looking for someone from capoeira for example last night because i didn't know anyone um you know go on the the facebook group we've got a facebook page but it's more lively on the group so it'd be lovely to have some interaction on there you know you can ask the teachers questions the teachers that have been on the show are most of them are very, vast majority of them are very happy to answer questions so yeah yeah come play with us there and say hey you know get someone on from bagua or whatever it is you particularly do uh we've got podcasts coming up from people that work in addiction recovery um let me see i've recorded 25 now actually so even though this might be podcast it's probably about 13 14 by the time it comes out uh one from jamie leno who's a, a golf pro who does aikido uh, we did one on bleed yoga for julia davis which is all about uh, menstruation and kind of women's issues if you will and yoga uh we've got Lots and lots of good ones already recorded. One from Adam Wilder. He's a really interesting guy. He runs a festival to talk togetherness. So lots already recorded and just a crazy number of people booked on the show. So um, do subscribe if, if you if you haven't already. I've been, I've been trying to think like how often to release podcasts. We're probably going to go for two a week. So let me know what you think of that. Um, so it's going to be pretty regular. At the moment, we're in this little launch period and we're getting a load out. We're trying to get into the new and noteworthy section of iTunes. So do, do review us to help us with that. Um, but yeah, it's probably settled on about two a week. So pretty um, pretty regular, pretty frequent uh, in terms of getting it out there. Um, the, today's one where it's like just me talking. So I'm probably going to do about one of those for every three or four interviews. It seems like they've been pretty popular, actually, the ones just with me going on, which I was surprised by. Um, it seems like some people want like an information download. So that's pretty good for that. And then the more kind of relational ones, you know, that's the interviews are going to be the main part as much as anything, because I want to learn stuff, right? You know, I want to talk to these interesting people. And uh, so they probably have about three or probably about three to one in terms of in favor of interviews. So uh, let me know what you think of that ratio and what you're really after. Again, let, let's make this a conversation. Okay, so today's topic. Um, this comes from an ebook we've just released, which is actually going to be part of a book on embodied yoga principles, one of my main practices, one of the main things I'm putting out there. And uh, the title of the ebook is called Making Yoga Meaningful. I was going to call it Making Yoga Less Fucking Pointless, but uh, my mentor, Paul Linden, suggested a more constructive title, and for once I listened to him. Um, so, what this is, is this ebook, which I'm basically going to be uh, reading from and um, working from today on the podcast, which you can find online. That's on the Embodied Yoga Principles website. Um, is, is about getting yoga off the mat and into life. It's about deepening uh, yoga asanas psychologically. So I'm going to be talking explicitly about yoga 
as one of the most popular body mind disciplines but this could really apply to um, any other art that you do in fact i first worked a lot of this content out with aikido so it certainly applies if you're if you're a martial artist or a dancer or anything else you know i was working with uh, one of my students at the moment does some um, queer dance she does um, rumba and salsa and various other kinds of dance for the queer community and she's using that in an embodied way using exactly the same uh, principles here okay so what you're going to get here is principles of learning effective transfer from yoga to the rest of your life and the practical how of making asana a much more deeper and useful practice the nuts and bolts of an innovative uh, innovative western yet deep approach to yoga so i was telling someone in moscow about this and they were like oh oh so so what it is it's sort of western but it's also deep i was like yeah that's exactly it yeah um pragmatic techniques for enhancing how much person how your personal practice impacts what you really care about and unique tools to help your students so if your teachers is you know it's a lot of this is designed for fairly experienced practitioners and teachers if you're a beginner you'll, you'll get something from it but uh most of the people are you know that come into it are pretty experienced um there's a quote here on the book from jude murray who's she does yoga for cancer she's super experienced yogi and she says uh, this approach to yoga has transformed my yoga teaching practice nowadays everyone including me leaves my classes with a clear sense of how to apply yoga to their lives in a very practical and straightforward way she's scottish so i think she likes that uh, my practice has changed the point that i could not go back even if i wanted to i remember uh, another senior teacher who trained with me Vididasa said that uh, normal yoga seems two-dimensional now that was uh, his quote and Karin his Dutch teacher says EYP has added a layer to my classes which enables students to explore their posture practice in a deeper way without demanding specific spiritual beliefs cultural paraphernalia dogma or philosophical complexity wow Dutch people are good at English aren't they it's incredible um, I could barely put a sentence together like that uh, it's simple pra- pra- practical pragmatic it gives people the opportunity to explore meaning and change their lives on the mat help me make my class more interactive and relevant to my students' lives and improve my relationship with my students. That's nice as well. Nice to see that. Okay, so um, 20 years ago, I walked into a yoga studio for the first time. Uh, I was sixth form uh, college, just kind of like high school. And, I, you know, it was about stretching and I felt kind of relaxed. I kind of didn't really see what, I could get from it beyond that you know I was like okay well health that's good you know I was kind of a teenager and wasn't living such a healthy lifestyle to say the least read between the lines and you know what I found was that yoga was yes it was kind of healthy but I didn't quite get what was the rich benefit there I'd been exposed to yoga my mother taught yoga I've been exposed to yoga a lot and then also the yoga scene was changing at that point it started to get kind of very commercial the kind of body beautiful yoga the Instagram yoga and you know I eventually got very critical of yoga and I, I saw yoga as sort of, you know, who cares if you're a bad gymnast? You know, like, what's the point? And also just in terms of health, I was thinking, well, how healthy do you need to be? You know, by the time I'd kind of got my health together a little bit, I was eating a bit better. I was doing martial arts for exercise. It was like, well, yeah, it's good to be healthy and that can have a positive impact on us for sure. But so, you know, just health, like it seems like modern yoga is a bit neurotically obsessed with this, particularly from a sort of materialist, middle class lifestyle point of view, um, kind of spiritual materialism to use. Uh, is it Chogam Trumpa? Is that how you say it? his name, his phrase um, seemed to be at work there. And also there was a lot of body image kind of tyranny that yoga seemed completely complicit in. Um, in kind of yoga advertising and you know if, if you just google now just google it trust me on the, you actually trust me try it just google yoga journal or yoga magazine and what will come up will be fairly young looking skinny white women that is what will come up um so i got fairly critical of yoga and uh, you know i saw people like the handstand craze and i was like okay why are people doing handstands like who cares like how does that change your life you know um there's a really nice quote from eric pascal who we're getting on the show at some point actually he says yoga is not about tightening your ass it's about getting your head out your ass and that's been a really popular meme and i think a lot of people are realizing there's more to life than athleticism it doesn't really matter if you can stand on your head at the end of the day um and also this kind of um sticking feathers up your ass and pretending you're an eastern chicken yeah so um you know if, if chinese gymnasts if, if if being flexible made you enlightened then chinese gymnasts would be the sort of top people in the world right in terms of being spiritual human beings and i just don't see that big a correlation between someone's say flexibility and how together they are in their life how kind they are how they treat their kids or their colleagues um so there seems to me like a real disconnect there and i got very very critical of this and you know eventually i thought you know what rather than being critical why not actually put something more constructive out there? So that's that's what I put together. And there was, there was a few pivotal experiences around this, which I'll, I'll come to shortly. 
been told I speak too quickly, particularly for non-native speakers. So uh, I'm making a bit of an effort to pause and breathe and slow down. And, you know, we like to keep these things interactive. So uh, if we're looking at yoga, postures are part of that might be worth noticing the posture with which you're listening to this or the way of walking if you're uh, walking along. Noticing I've got a slightly croaky voice this morning. I seem to have woke up with a the sexy croaky voice, but uh, hopefully this water will help. So I realized that there's yoga for um, fitness and that's completely valid. You know, I, I can criticize that, but actually say, oh, it's not yoga. But actually, you know, there's nothing wrong with fitness. There's nothing wrong with it. I do some good body weight stuff for fitness. You know, I was walking last night. Part of the reason was just fitness. That's fine. You know, uh, and then there's also the spiritual side. We might think of the Eastern exotic side. As a Buddhist, obviously, I'm not against that. You know, it's nothing wrong with that. And uh, the practice I'm going to describe to you is all mindfulness based. You know, and I've noticed that that's inaccessible to a lot of people, or it can lead to this um, kind of false self. Yeah, this kind of false self where people are pretending to be something they're not. I remember uh, the first time I really saw that I was actually in Moscow and I walked into a yoga studio and um, there's a load of Russians and they were sitting around and they were using Sanskrit words and they were playing sitars and dressed in Indian clothes and eating Indian food. And it just seemed silly, you know, and then I realized like, it was no more silly than English people doing that or Americans doing that. Just somehow it stood out more for me because I was in Moscow and it was such a contrast with the kind of culture in the street I'd just been in. And realising there's more to life than health, you know, another green smoothie, really. There's got to be more to it than that. Um, it just seemed like... Uh, uh, a pretty uh, big obsession. Um, you know, some people say, well, what is yoga? I think it's a good question. Um, for me, you know, if it's awareness based, uh, then it's, then it's, it's, that's, that's an absolute definite. So for me, like the sort of exercise yoga is more like yoga in inverted commas. People could get into wars about this. You know, I've had people say, who are you to say what yoga is? And this is slightly teenage kind of like who gets to say what yoga is and isn't. And that's led to some of the excesses we see in culture. Um, yeah, particularly sort of American style commercialization of yoga. There's actually a celebrity TV show, like a reality TV show currently on in the United States about uh, becoming a top yoga teacher. Yeah, it's certainly gone a bit far, the sort of Instagram stuff you'll see certain uh, places I go to it's more about the externally facing rather than the if the feeling in and certainly in cahoots with kind of consumer culture and some people say look you're not a yoga teacher I say no actually I wouldn't qualify myself as a yoga teacher I'd say I'm an embodiment teacher who worked with yogis who's yeah done quite a bit of yoga over 20 years I've had uh, peer um, I've had mentor mentee relationships with three very senior teachers in particular for at least 10 years in Brighton a guy called Pete Blackaby a guy called Jim Caron and Dad Gary Carter Gary Carter was on the show actually his show his put episode has been the most popular so far incidentally i think what is embodiment but the, from what i did was second and his his one on uh, yoga and anatomy we talked about it's been it's been pretty popular okay so yes i come from a yoga background i have yoga teachers long term but no i don't um uh, think of myself primarily as a yoga teacher i'm someone who helps yoga teachers as well as you know business people or coaches or whatever and for me the key thing in my own practice and to help yoga teachers with is a yoga that actually matters so away from the kind of well-being obsession from athleticism or technical neurosis getting very tied tied into these very technical conversations about the exact right you know i saw a whole book on the perfect chaturanga which is a, a yoga posture if you're new to this and uh, i just thought who cares you know who cares you know what I often begin an embodied yoga principles class, EYP, I'll call that from now on, EYP class, by asking, like, what do you care about? And people say their work. Actually, sometimes people forget their work. It's interesting in yoga, people forget that aspect of life. Uh, they often say their kids, they might say politics, they might say friendships, they might say their sex lives. And I say, okay, let's do a yoga that matters for that. Let's do a yoga which is in keeping with your actual values. So this isn't about telling people what to do. And as I said, I sort of got past the criticism and thought, okay, let's do something constructive. Rather than telling people what to do or criticizing, it's about saying, look, what do you really care about? Let's see if we can get that uh, involved on the mat and take the yoga off the mat to what do you really care about? Yeah. Just starting classes, I mentioned Jude on there, he's one of the senior EYP teachers that's got a lot from this. And Gary Carter does the same thing on his workshops, is saying, like, what have you come for? Like, what are you here for? You know, because people can be there in yoga. I was in, I was in a lunchtime yoga class yesterday and I just wanted to relax. I just wanted a little mindful break from my day. And the teacher's doing this really intense, traditional, kind of my angry kind of practice. I was just like, oh, this is so not what I need right now. And I was able to take breaks. You know, they weren't brutal, they're a you know, kind, intelligent teacher. But it just wasn't aligned with what I wanted. So a lot of this is about clarifying, like, what are you trying to get from yoga? I mean, is it a holiday from reality um, or is it actually a school and education? So we'll come back to that, that concept key, uh, shortly. OK, so some key tensions in making yoga practical. Yeah, 
I think of this in terms of tensions, in terms of considerations, um, things, approaches that one can consider if you want to make your yoga or Aikido or anything else practical off the mat. I mean, one, in, in martial arts, they have this lovely distinction between a do and a jitsu. So a jitsu, like Aiki Jiu-Jitsu um, or, or Jiu-Jitsu or uh, Kenjitsu, would be techniques. So these are things for actual combat. Uh, a do, like Aikido or Kendo or Judo, is something which is, at least uh, in the original intention, meant as a personal development art. So do means path or way. It's kind of a cliche to say it, but that's the Japanese character. And um, it's... It's for your life. It's for you to grow as a person. Um, technique is, is sort of known as being seductive and people can get uh, caught in technique. However, keeping the emphasis on the do is um, the art of many of these Japanese arts. And it's worth, you know, are you practicing yoga jitsu? Are you trying to do the handstand because it's a technique? Or is the handstand, you know, handstand could be a really good way. I did a video on this, actually. could be a really good way of exploring, say, fear or how you relate to challenge or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's a reflection we can all have. It's like how much of a do and how much of a jitsu is your practice. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, yoga can have a fairly modest jitsu aim, like getting fit. And uh, totally valid again. I don't want to badmouth that. And, and, and this can still be a stepping stone into other things. I think, you know, this is the kind of gateway drug theory is how I often describe it. Um, there's many approaches to yoga that I might sort of snobbily think are a bit limited, but they can lead to deeper practices. Yeah. Um, now, in some ways, we might say, you know, it's like using a Michelangelo statue as a doorstop, uh, but it can still attract people to go further, you know. After all, you know, I started Aikido as a martial art because I was a criminal and wanted to defend my business. You know, that was my main motivation. But Aikido enabled me to open up from that sort of art of like a young man who wants to fight as a practical skill. You know, it could be a, a, young, a young man who wants to be physically attractive or whatever it is to show off to his friends. But there was a the structure of that enabled this kind of gateway into other things. I think if the structure doesn't, if it's sort of fundamentally egoic, we could call it a travesty. Yeah, a travesty. So a travesty is where you sacrifice something bigger for something smaller. It's the opposite of a sacrifice in some ways. Um, so a tr yoga can be a travesty. And I think while not being too snobby and seeing the gateway theory and going, yep, things can open up and lead to other things. I think it is not it's worth being more than just kind of purely postmodern pluralistic and relativist and saying, you know, everything's fine. Everything's good. And actually challenging some of these things, you know, where it looks like utter bullshit and really just challenging some of that. I'd still stand by that, even though it's not something I spend so much energy on. Um, the thing I'd really like to call bullshit on is where this self-deception, um, so often there's this sort of thin spirit, spiritual veneer over a practice. And, listening to a podcast I was on the other day what was it uh, the body awakens and there was a teacher on there and she was talking about hidden motives so often I think these these second motives aren't very hidden you know it's um why are you really doing your practice and we can't it's hard to be honest with ourselves so a question can be if I was doing this practice for self-development or for spirituality or whatever it would be what would it really look like would I really be worrying so much about the leggings I'm wear or wearing for example so sometimes the behavior shows more honest honestly than a sort of just a subjective checking in um and when there's this veneer it's hard to work with so someone came to me in moscow once and said you know what i just do yoga to be skinny because i want to be attractive to find a husband and i was like whoa that's pretty honest and pretty different from my values and in moscow that's not an unusual thing to say and i said okay well you know that's not really the yoga that i do but if, if you want you know you can be in my class and uh, I can work with that, you know, and I work with like what makes someone really attractive. And of course, what makes someone really attractive, I'll do an episode on this, is from the inside out. It's self-love and confidence and all those sort of things. And that opened her up into something much deeper. So I was able to work with that person fairly easily. Uh, where it's harder to work with is if someone says their motivation is something much deeper, but it really isn't. And every behavior would indicate that it isn't. So, um, yeah, this is this kind of deceptive. And I think we can be self-deceptive in this can be tricky to work with. And that's what I still uh, would take a stand against. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this is a question you can ask yourself. What is the fundamental aim of yoga generally or your own practice? And how might you be kidding yourself a little bit? Because there's a way in which the ego kind of comes in and takes over whatever's being done and turns it into something for self-aggrandizement. And I don't think that's just me being sick. I think that's all of us. Yeah. 
Okay, let's look at the fundamental challenge, if you will, in making any art practical, and that's container versus transfer. So this is a tension there. Um, so a container uh, is what makes a practice a practice. If you look at my video, if you hear my podcast, sorry, on practice, I go into this in some detail. Um, so a practice, in a practice, we add special rules, language, ritual. It's got a different social structure, often more kind of hierarchical or clearly defined. Critical things are removed, like you don't often talk in a yoga class. You wouldn't uh, necessarily have much sexual activity, hopefully. Um, it's a simplified place. Yeah, that's the point. You make it simple so that you can, A, it's safe. It's not You're not going to lose your actual job or your actual husband or whatever it is in the class. Um, so if you mess up, you know, in a martial arts dojo, you might get hit a little bit, but you're not going to get killed. Yeah, you might get a bump on the head at worst. So um, it's essentially inconsequential place. And this is when I say, you know, the beauty of yoga is that it's pointless. People sometimes take that the wrong way. What I mean by that is is by uh, making it physically, financially, and relationally as safe as possible, we take out some of the psychological, emotional, and existential risks. Trust can be built. We can work on ourselves. We can get things wrong. We can play with things. This is, again, where ethics matters so much for teachers in this field. Uh, we want to make the classes safe, predictable, um, you know, things like, even just things like timings, like oh, I've got one teacher and God love him, but he often ends and starts and finishes classes late. And it's like having clear boundaries and rather being flaky about that helps with that container. So a firm container is about consistency. It's about rules, it's about discipline. You know, and I get it. If your personality is anything like me or you're very liberal politically, this might seem all a bit much. <laughs> But it's interesting to me that lots of people who have my personality or that kind of more liberal politics are drawn to these like, you know, structured yoga classes and Japanese martial arts. It's actually a bit weird, you know, a place where you get told what to do and everyone's sitting in lines. You know, it's a bit unusual. So there is these strong containers that are absolutely necessary. And if if it's not a, a container in that way, it's just life. And then we can't practice because it's uh, it's not safe. So the, the basic things are a safety because your actual life matters too much. Consistency, life's a bit random to really practice stuff. You can control the variables, you know, like keeping that sweet spot of learning rather than uh, uh, be overwhelmed or be bored. Um, you know, hopefully a good yoga teacher is giving you that sweet spot. You know, it's, it's like you can't really tell your kids to be 20% less annoying because you want to work on the optimal point for your breathing technique. A, it's not fair on them. B, you just, you just can't do that with partners or whatever um yeah and getting dedicated expert feedback um what we could call non-partisan coaching again people in life just aren't in there to do that that's not their job and to have someone who's dedicated to you and a community around you to do that is fantastic so this is what i mean by the container it's different from real life it's simplified and the the danger of course here is it becomes so different from real life that there isn't transfer back yeah. Um, so, so let's take because speaking is not part of, say, generally a, a yoga or martial arts class. We might not actually transfer the skills into the verbal or the social because socializing again is often taken out. Everyone's on their own little mat. Those skills are taken out um, and it might not transfer back into what we could call the verbal social domain. And that's that's where we live. Right. That, that's how we're spending most of our days, most of our work, for most people anyway, uh, is interacting with other human beings. So yes, we've taken that out for safety and simplicity, but phew, a little bit tricky because it might not transfer back. Things do not transfer back automatically. There's a sort of naive view that if you just do yoga, or you just do Aikido or whatever it is, it's going to magically transfer back. And that's just not the case. And the reason that's not, we can tell that's not the case is there are in, in Aikido, we call them six Dan assholes. So that's a six degree black belt who is uh, it's a very senior grade, who's just an asshole. Maybe they're alcoholic or hitting their kids or a nightmare as a boss or whatever it is. And it's clear that it hasn't transferred back for them. Now, you could make the argument they'd be worse without the Aikido or whatever. They might probably would be a bit worse. But it's still it's clear that something's going wrong there. And the same in Aikido and in, in yoga. We see this again and again and again. People are very flexible, very strong, you know, skinny, whatever the, the aim is. But actually, it's not really transferring. And, I, you know, I, frankly, I was shocked. A few years ago, I started focusing more on the yoga side than the martial arts. And I was spending much more time in the wider yoga community outside of the little classes I'd gone to for years in Brighton. And I was shocked by some of the behavior. I really was. And I, I can honestly say that at yoga festivals, I've, I've been treated way worse than at martial arts camps. And there's several reasons for that. That You know, at martial arts camps is pretty serious consequences if you're rude to people. Um that's one of them. But it's also, it's also to do with the practice itself and the nature of people practicing in relationship or self-regulation. But I was pretty shocked by some of the behavior I've come across uh, in the yoga world, you know, particularly around uh, money or just manners, you know, just people being rude. So I thought, okay, it can't just be 
like Aikido, it can't be magically transferring back. Uh, and part of this is the fact that the container can be too different. Yeah, the container can be too unusual. And this is all in learning theory. You know, there's good scientific studies on this. For example, some fascinating ones. Like if you if you learn a skill underwater, uh, you might not be able to do that skill on dry land. There's some great studies on that. Um, I had an instance once where I turned up to Aikido and I'd forgotten, and it's about five or six years into Aikido, and I'd forgotten my Aikido outfit, my gi, they call it. And I turned up and I was like, okay. And the teacher just looked at me and said, you know what? Just train in your normal clothes because I was wearing fairly comfortable street clothes. He said, you know what? I know you haven't done this for years, but train your normal clothes. And I, I did. And my technique was loads worse, like loads worse. And I was like, wow, that's a bit of a problem if I ever had to apply these techniques in the street, as they say, in self-defense that my technique is so used to learning something in these clothes, I, I found it hard out of those clothes. You know, and I actually, I'll go to yoga in my normal clothes, unless it's a very athletic class. Even I've even seen students not be able to learn to repeat a skill that they've learned facing one direction when they turn around. So literally something as simple as turning around or changing your clothes can dramatically uh, reduce the uh, the skill there. Uh, there's a great TED talk on learning versus performance um, that, that you can look up as well. Just put learning versus performance TED into YouTube and you'll find that. Yeah, so, so you might want to reflect on what are some of the major differences between your life and a yoga class and again that sounds silly but really think about it like what's missing what's different um and you might want to ask how can you build a better container and how can you loosen that container and we'll come to ways as, as i go on through this uh, episode about loosening that container so again back to this idea of the holiday of the classroom more transcendent so any class can be thought of as a holiday from reality a break from reality and in that case, we want the container to be as different as possible, right? Like yoga music and special yoga space and special yoga words and special yoga clothes. And that's really nice. And I'm not slagging that off, actually, because sometimes, like I said yesterday, I just wanted a break. You know, you go to class and you just want a break. Uh, the transcendence is the sort of rising above normal life, rising out of normal life. And that is definitely prevalent in the sort of yoga and meditation world. The frame I like is the classroom. So this is more the dojo sense where we're looking at the uh, yoga shala or the dojo as a way to learn about ourself and to learn skills for life. Yeah. Um, the transcendence idea is like, look, I don't want to improve the dream. I want to wake people up. That's what one teacher said to me. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm more about what you call the dream. Yeah. What I call reality. Uh, so um, it's not about rising above worldly concerns or transcending them. Uh, we can think of this as the householder path. So um, traditionally, that's family and career. So in Catholicism, it's interesting. There's a medieval precedent for this, which is not very cool, but uh, I think it shows the point. You could even be a monastic and devote yourself fully to Jesus as a monk or a nun. And, uh, you know, that's a valid path. My mum actually was a nun for some years and it, you know, she got a lot from it. And I, I've met all her old nun friends and they're still like these shiny old women years later. You know, so there's definitely something in the monastic way. I've spent time in Buddhist monasteries myself. Um, but then there's the householder path. And that's, you know, being in the mud and the shit and the menstrual blood of the real world. Um, for me, that's where I'm at now. You know, I'm married. I'm uh, I run a business. I'm in the world. Um, and we have to deal with things like money and marriage. And in, in some ways in Catholicism, it was considered the easier path to be a monastic. Um, and the really challenging path was doing it in the world. And look at um, Miles Kessler and I did a podcast on taking it to the marketplace. So that's really about this. And he's someone that really went into that monastic type way of life. And uh, now he's a family man, a dad and runs a business, etc. So, um, yeah, those distinctions, holiday, classroom and transcendence, like which is your yoga most about? Now, it could be kind of a mix. And I get that. Like you might give people a bit of a holiday before going more into the classroom side just to give them a rest before that's their resource to learn. But here's the thing. You, you can't chase three rabbits. Function, the, the, the method you're doing follows the function. So that the methodology follows the aim of a class. So yes, different people can get different things out of a class and good for them. Why not? However, you're going to have fundamentally different uh, methodologies depending on what you're doing. So, you know, this class I went to last lunchtime, the teacher was doing this like fairly hardcore postures and da -da 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 -da, sort of more like, you know, pushing through to spiritual enlightenment. And that method just wasn't what I was wanting. I was wanting just a little bit of gentle relaxation and mindfulness for where I was at. Now, I could pick a different class. That's fine. But she wasn't explicit in what she said at the beginning of the class about what the class is for. She was actually uh, coming in to teach someone else's class as a supply, as a supply teacher. They were off from retreat. Again, very good teacher. But was it a bad fit for me in that moment? Yes. Yeah. 
A parallel here is the hero's journey. So maybe you've heard of Joseph Campbell. Uh, the hero's journey is a uh, he's a mythologist, and he looked at kind of different myths from around the world, different stories, and saw there was a pattern to it. Um, this pattern basically is from the familiar to the unfamiliar, back to the familiar again, from the known out into the unknown, uh, and then back to the known. Um, so like stories generally have this it's like Bilbo Baggins and he's you know at home and then there's a knock on the door and it's Gandalf and that's the call to adventure and then he crosses the threshold and sometimes his threshold guardians or you get given swords and things along the way uh, mentors and there's some sort of uh, abyss death and rebirth and then coming out of that and the tricky bit is the return home and uh, I think in the original Lord of the Rings, he returns home and the Shire has been taken over by orcs and he has to sort of fight another battle he's not expecting. And then there's the difficulty in reassimilating and sort of being a normal hobbit, etc., etc. Um, you know, the, the journey doesn't end when you've done the intense bit. And you can think of a yoga class like that, like you're taking people from their known world, everyday life, and then maybe they step into this container and they put on the special clothes or go into the room with the no talking or whatever it is. And that's like entering into this different world. Yeah, this other world. And then they do a practice which, you know, may have some intensity to it, even if it's a very yin practice, you know, like very intense in a different way, where you're in a way being dying and being withdrawn. But of course, the average yoga class ends with Shavasana. They kind of end with the death. And then it's just like everyone jumps up and gets their phones out and goes back on with their life. That reintegration part uh, is normally not done well. That how do you take it back is normally not done well and it almost ends right in the depths of it so if you listen to the podcast on cycles you'll see what's wrong with this uh there isn't an autumn in that sense yeah so yeah maybe worth reflecting upon your class like how does that hero's journey work is there a definite stepping into the class you know that can be quite helpful there's a definite threshold in this model um and then you know how do you step out of it to integrate so um that is the key thing there that is the key thing okay should we take another breath <sighs> A lot of information here, a lot of information. Let it wash over you, I would say, and then maybe take a look at the ebook if this is like a super interesting subject to you. You know, it's free, so you can, you can find the way. It's free for the next few weeks, actually, so you can find that online. All right, so what works? What actually helps for getting yoga off the mat? Um, let's go through a bit of a list here. So um, intention is powerful, but not all powerful. To have that as an intention, I'd say is very helpful. Um, it's a good start and it's good to sort of bookend practice with that. We call it the yoga sandwich where we sort of say at the beginning, you know, what are you bringing? And then afterwards, what are you taking out? That intention to take it off the mat. I was in a nice vinyasa class the other day, a very traditional kind of flowy vinyasa class in some ways. At the end, the teacher just said, having an intention to take this into your life. And I thought, wow, that's great. Nice one. Kudos to that teacher for saying that because most of the people in, in his particular class were sort of just more there for fitness and he was trying to open them to new things, which I appreciate. And I was left with a little bit, yeah, but how? You know, for those people who don't know how to do that, like what would that uh, actually look like? Yeah. And I think it's worth um, setting, having that intention and the beginning of class and end of class. And I've just noticed it can get so lost, particularly if the class is a little bit more um, athletic. Whew, it's getting hot here. I'm on a kind of grey morning in, in England in, in autumn and I'm... Uh, Turn the heating on. At that point, we're trying to get the heating at the right levels. Okay, health. So I've mentioned health is a foundation. Of course, health matters. I don't know about you, but when I'm healthier, I'm just a nicer person to be around. You know, health can really can support our ethics and our kindness. Uh, of course, it's a valid part of yoga. Um, and it's just not what I personally focus on because it seems like the rest of the industry is super obsessed with that and super focusing on that. So I kind of leave that one to everyone else. Um, another frame is like yoga is medicine. So um, this is a specific field of yoga therapy. And if you look at books by like Ayanga or people like that, it will say, you know, this posture is good for that. It's hard to determine what is kind of superstition and it's just been made up. Um, this, you know, there's so much bad science in these things about things detoxifying your liver. And we'll have Arowana Rabinovich on the show. Uh, look at her yoga myths book you can find. It's really good. And there's the science of yoga out there. There's another book. Um, yeah, this you know, saying it's ancient wisdom, which it often isn't. So you've got to be careful of the dodgy science. But it does definitely seems to be that um, certain postures can help with certain things. You know, I have an embodiment model of that, which I'll come into. Um, I, as someone who works with psychology, I've definitely seen that certain postures really help with certain psychological issues. You know, I've got videos out there on anger, anxiety, confidence, depression, grief, and none of them are uh, 
uh, like replacement for medication and therapy and all the good things that we do, nature, social support, etc. But they can be helpful. So if you know if any of those issues you know, affect you, then um, yeah, you could look at those videos. So just put, basically put in EYP and then anger, anxiety, confidence, depression, grief. You can try some other ones. There's the few common ones that I know affect people. And some of those coming out of my own experience, you know, like, you know, after my dad died, I was doing a lot of child's pose and finding that very helpful with grieving and the grieving process. And sometimes doing, just doing some warrior pose to like get up and about when I was kind of down. You could look up specific medical issues you have and look at yoga's medicine. I think, you know, it's a valid perspective. Again, it's not my particular one. So I'll, I think I'll let other people talk more expertly on that. One thing we can look at, and I think this is often overlooked, um, is the benefits of any practice community in place. So if you're consistently doing anything, let's say you wake up every day and you practice, I don't know, bricklaying, practice making a wall out of bricks, yeah? Um, that is going to be helpful because it gives you that sense of discipline, that sense of achieving something. You're saying to yourself, I'm doing something positive for myself. This is uh, an act of self-love. You know, this is uh, something I'm doing for myself. Just doing something regularly and um, will reinforce your sense of self-worth, build your discipline and self-trust. This idea of, like, let's say you get up every day and do the Ashtanga sequence. I've got friends that do that. We've got an Ashtanga teacher coming on, actually, Ryan, on the show at some point. Um, uh, Ryan Spillman, good, uh, good Ashtanga teacher in London. You know, let's say you're folding napkins every day. You still get all of those things or building a wall. You still get all those things in terms of trusting yourself and saying, I'm investing in my self-care. Yeah. Um, on top of that, if you're around people who also have that shared commitment to wall building or napkin folding, you're in community with those people. Yeah. Uh, that they're also other people who are dedicated to improving themselves in some way. You know, even if it's just like a health and fitness yoga class, you're around a whole bunch of people that have bothered to get off the couch and go to a yoga class. Uh, that's really helpful. Yeah. Uh, the same as if you're in a beautiful environment, you know, most yoga studios are pretty pleasant. I go to the uh, local Buddhist center to do a yoga class with my friend Vid Vididasa once or twice a week. It's relaxing. It's a nice place to be. The physical environment is uplifting. That might take me out of sort of my messy office or whatever it is uh, that supportive container um is very helpful you know and i actually have a space in my home that i keep clear and my wife continuously attempts to colonize it sweetie that she is with different things and i always move her stuff out and keep it as a sort of clear uh, beautiful aesthetic space with a little shrine and it's, it's 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 kept clean you know that can be really helpful to have to make that place if you can't get to one um you know i've noticed we do uh, this course called the embodied facilitator course and uh, we do five modules and one of them is always in the countryside so it's either the russian or the or the british countryside and the british one's in beautiful kent which is called the garden of england and it's kind of what that sounds like and in russia it's by this beautiful lake and it's just such a better module than all the urban modules it just people go deeper they connect more uh, they have more uh, profound experiences they learn better because of the environment and actually in changing EFC next year we, we had a big decision like do we do one in central london again we actually have this beautiful a studio and it really is different and helpful it gives creates a different energy or different embodiment if you will um or do we do it in the countryside and it's like which is going to best serve the process you know really looking at place um listen to the podcast on place like the one by adrian harris that's uh, all about place if that's interesting you absolutely like community uh is a big part of what influences the place is a big part and that regularity of practice that committing to ourself um is there oh there's a great article on community called why every yoga needs a soup kitchen i believe that's matthew remsky r-e-m-s-k-i one of the cleverest people in yoga even if we disagree sometimes that is a function of spirituality traditionally is kind of service and community and that can be missing in the sort of hyper individualistic modern yoga paradigm uh, we intergrow, so it really can't stress the importance of community enough. And this is almost like no matter what you're doing, we've talked about community in place and this discipline. So um, I think that's understated as a thing, those factors. Yeah. OK, let's look at direct skill transfer. So um, there are some yoga skills that you can take directly into life. So we had Julia on here. Uh, she has, Her episode hasn't been released yet, but when it will, she talks about like, you know, doing a, a nostril breathing exercise in life. That's something literally you can take from yoga off the mat. Um, she showed a way to do it just with concentration rather than putting the hands on the nostrils because she said, look, this is more practical. This is something people won't stare at you for doing uh, if you're embarrassed to do that. Um, you know, the, that's great. I think it's a nice example that she did. Obviously, breathing exercises are often pretty portable or exercises with the eyes can also be good. 
Um, it is tricky, though, to suddenly you know, pull a quick shavasana in the middle of a board meeting or a quick downwards dog. So, yep, it can be useful to take you know, breathing breaks. You might want to schedule those in your diary. You might want to pause this and schedule a few of those in to remind yourself to do that. Often people just forget uh, or have some sort of interruption software on your phone or your computer. Um, yeah, that's the, they're the sort of direct skills from, um, from yoga. Um, we, we have to talk about mindfulness, obviously. So mindfulness is a massive part of yoga. I, I believe it's not really yoga if there isn't mindfulness. It's the basis of learning other skills. It's the basis of other things. So unfortunately, there's several things in modern yoga that can uh, get in the way, if you will, of mindfulness. Um, let me just take you through those. So if there's excessive intensity, like that's kind of addictive because on the one hand it forces you to be mindful but who really wants to pay attention to a screaming body it can cover up some of the more subtle emotional sensations and i've i've definitely seen uh, people with trauma histories get very very into intense martial arts and intense like hot yoga and things like that because they don't want to feel the more subtle things that are happening yeah like loud music hot rooms incredibly difficult practice it seems like yoga is always getting more and more intense you know like um this uh you know it's like torture death screaming rocket yoga is the latest thing and it just seems like really is that really helping you tune into your body um well in a way it does help in the short term but you're not really building that skill in the long term because it's like how do you tune in when there isn't such a strong sensation uh, another thing that can not help with mindfulness which is super common in yoga is, is conformity so the average yoga class is sort of taken from my Engers model uh, you know they didn't used to be yoga classes up till I think about the 60s it used to always be a one-to-one or one to small group practice um, then you know Iyengar realized you could do kind of group practices more and the problem is you have an authority figure that everyone follows so everyone tries to make the shape um, or the, what do what the authority to figure is doing, and that means they're not really listening to their own body. They're not really practicing self-awareness as to what they need. Um, so this is the norm in modern yoga to be practicing conformity in this way. And uh, I really challenge this. You know, obviously a good yoga teacher, I would hope, is telling people to listen to their bodies, but then, you know, often it's just lip service to that. You know, do they really allow for variation and do they you know do they say when someone takes a rest well done and actually sort of socially support that yeah or is there some sort of subtle social enforcement of conformity which there often is um other things that can repress mindfulness so sexual and emotional suppression uh you know often emotions aren't a part of a lot of martial arts for example or yoga i've, I've seen the sex organs completely missed out from body scans you know it's just like legs and then hips and then belly i'm like hang on a minute you missed a bit um Another thing which doesn't help is the sort of body beautification culture I talked about earlier. Um, that way makes people externally facing. Um, and also the community. So, you know, is the community, you know, safe, supportive? It's very difficult to practice, you know, interioception if you're engaged in very, very social activity all the time um, or you're, you're feeling judged or you're feeling threatened. It's very difficult to just tune into yourself because it creates this sense of alertness and, and uh, looking outside of oneself. So many of these are pretty standard in yoga. So, you know, what I recommend just to, take those five points and turn them around is a moderate practice that could still be pretty da da uh, dynamic or challenging depending on the person's abilities. So number one, moderate. Number two, internally led with a false sense respected as the ultimate authority. Number three, sexually and emotionally aware. That doesn't mean, you know, we're picking up people in class or crying all the time in yoga, but aware that those are parts of our being. Uh, in, in addresses the body as a subjective, i.e. as an embodied way and accepts all body types. So, you know, I think the body positivity stuff is really good. I think there's a case for saying it can go too far in some ways, but that's another podcast, so potentially a bit controversial for now, but basically a very good thing um, and done in a supportive ethical community. So these are key ethical axioms um, that can be woven into practice. But for me, that's the actual basis. If you don't have that mindfulness, then... Uh, that's the foundation for all the embodiment stuff I'm going to talk about. Um, you know, the emotional quality is important. So helping people notice the feeling tone of their practice. This is directly applicable to life. You know, noticing how you are emotionally. I you know, just the other day I was just sitting there and I was about to go to dance practice. I just tuned into myself a little bit and I was like, you know, what? I actually don't want to go. I, I, and then I thought, am I just being lazy? I'm like, no, I want to move. I just don't want to be around loud music and lots of people. So I was with a friend and we were going to go dancing and she agreed. She had the same feeling and we went for a walk in the rain for an hour and had a chat and walked in the rain. It was, you know, much more peaceful and it was just what we needed. That just feeling into like, how do I feel right now? Uh, from the Buddhist point of view, it's Vedana. You know, it's like, is it okay? Does it feel good? Does it feel not good? Does it feel neutral? Tuning people into that, I think, is very helpful uh, 
in a yoga class and you know you can play with it more playfully like um jude who i mentioned earlier she says what animal are you what kind of tail have you got you know or i get people to make a noise to kind of express their emotion um or i'll get people to sort of you know say one word at the beginning of class or to raise their hands in terms of checking the energy levels high low or medium to get strong participation there um so it's worth reflecting for a moment what's the relationship of emotion to your practice the asian arts tend to not be so big on emotions it's mind body spirit not mind body heart spirit uh, certainly in the martial arts it's just not something we talk about i remember once i taught an aikido class where we did different uh, arm locks from different emotional states to explore that and it was just completely mind-blowing to people they were like people that aikido for 30 years had never even thought about the emotional states they're in because the emotional states create directions of forward or down or up or whatever and uh, that really impacts the technique actually all right so that's the emotional side oh let's look at yoga sandwiches and yoga snacks i like this idea so yoga sandwich i talked about this briefly earlier uh, is encouraging awareness before and after class so there's a way in which a class can be too contained and that can lead to lack of transfer as we discussed um so a way to loosen that is to get people to be aware on the way to class. Obviously, you know, if it's a first class, you have to remind them it's difficult to do that. Um, but some, you know, I had this realization. I was rushing to a yoga class at the Buddhist center, and on my way there, I sort of ignored a friend I didn't have time to speak with, and I was sort of rude to the receptionist. And I just thought, hang on a minute, what am I doing? I'm rushing. I'm being mildly unethical. What am I doing? Like, I have to make this at least make the ten minutes before class uh, kind of yogic, whatever that means. And afterwards, right? Like, you know, I say to my students at the end of class, "Is there a quality that we've done in the class, like from warrior pose or from being open or whatever it is, that you might want to bring into your evening? Is there some of the ethical things we've been exploring? I'll come on to that in a bit uh, that you might want to bring into your evening. You probably weren't going to kill anyone this evening, but you might want to be a bit kinder or, you know, not stealing time in the wider sense or being a bit more honest or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, that's the bread, if you will, of the yoga sandwich. Uh, and snacks, again, is you can you can pause this podcast now if you want and put little reminders on your phone to reminding yourself like and i think the simplest one is how am i how do i want to be awareness and choice i always say is the uh the fundamental thing uh, awareness and choice so yeah the simplest way to do it would be these little snacks of asking people you know what it, how asking yourself sorry you can do this with pairs as well or in groups if, if everyone's up for it how am i and how do i want to be awareness and choice the most uh simple thing yeah um yeah, so that's, that's for me, the little yoga snacks throughout the day. Because most of the time, we just need reminding. And that's what mindfulness means. To remember, actually, the, the word mindfulness uh, is a funny translation of the Pali. Uh, remembrance would actually be, in some ways, a better translation. Okay, so there's another there's a video out there on yoga, the yoga sandwich. If you just Google yoga sandwich, you'll probably come up with it. Learning general life skills. Um, yeah, so what are the skills you're learning? Well, you learn body awareness. That's the foundation of a lot of what we do seeing a yoga class as a place to learn life skills i think it's a really useful frame because it's not esoteric it's it's very straightforward i use a model adapted from daniel goldman's model of emotional intelligence that we apply to embodied intelligence essentially emotional intelligence is a subset of embodied intelligence uh, if you look up youtube embodied intelligence or maybe even image search that you'll probably come up with that image Think of it in terms of skills, you know, body awareness being a good skill. That's a good basis of a lot of things. It's also worth looking a little bit more into what you mean by that. Because, again, you could do a very intense practice and become quite aware of your muscles. But what about the more subtle kind of more the organs and the, the face and the kind of more sort of subtle emotions that are going on, the more subtle pieces of body awareness, you know, is it about movement as well as about posture? People can get very rigid in their posture and not be aware of how they're moving or how they're speaking you know as a podcast host i've become much more aware recently that i speak a bit quick or the tone of my voice maybe i get panicky or whatever it is um so yeah bringing awareness more a bit more broadly than just to like am i standing in the correct iyengar way uh, i think the key thing that's often missing in yoga is awareness of others so unless you're doing a partner or an acro practice this can be really missing um is realizing you know your your, your partner i've even seen people done quite a lot of acro to just not who are just aren't aware if their partner's scared or if their partner's being a bit cocky or whatever it is like being aware of your partner's breathing you know that's something um a good considerate say acro yoga partner will be aware of and i think it's one of the edges things like tango or salsa or aikido have over things like single solo tai chi or standard solo yoga uh, is it not necessarily building that skill and i would say we all need some kind of relational practice to build that skill of awareness of others and then we have managing. So there's managing ourself. I think yoga is very good for this. Modern post yoga is extremely good for um, learning to better regulate ourselves. You know, it's like you're in a posture and it's difficult. 
and then your teacher says relax your forehead yeah um what's often missing is the bridging practice into life so you get very good at managing yourself doing um i don't know a tree posture that's a bit anxiety provoking or a difficult you know kind of a squat that's a bit physically difficult but then bridging that into life so i get you know our students to think of something stressful and then all of a sudden they have the same fight flight response uh, and then they can learn to regulate that look listen to the podcast on centering if you want some really expert advice on that it's one of the things that we've worked out really really well um, and then there's the leadership side right like we call that embodied leadership uh influencing people again you need a partner practice for this you know like how do you influence their emotions um teachers are doing this all the time so any good yoga teacher is sometimes waking people up and sometimes calming people down with their voice and their gestures, um, with humor, uh, with the postures they're picking. You know, there's lots of ways to do that and just by just by doing it in their own body and standing close to people. You somatically influence people. So the idea of embodied leadership, I think, is is uh, is really key there. Uh, and again, this is a good reflection to look at how am I doing things in my life? Yeah. Which of these skills am I building in a yoga class? What's missing? What skills am I already building? What might I need to add to my practice or add a supplementary practice? Sometimes, you know, you might be like, look, I do this regular Ashtanga practice is really good for body awareness and for, for self-regulation. But it's not so good for this. So I'm going to start doing a dance class once a week to supplement that. Um, so looking at embodied skills acquisition, I think it's nice, not too esoteric, nice and helpful. OK, so um, practice ladders is the next one. So a practice ladder is what you need to learn any skill safely. So starting off gently, then working your way up to more intense step by step so you're not traumatizing yourself or your students keeping in that learning zone rather than the panic zone or the comfort zone so this is a practice ladder and it's a key skill for many of the things i've just talked about and i've talked about bridging practices how we connect the outside world in so how how do we make it how do we loosen the container and make something a little bit more realistic for example sometimes i'll, I'll literally get to get their mobile phones out in class and stand in a you know mountain posture or a centered way while holding their phone two basic ways of looking at a practice form versus freedom practice this is relates to the skills again so form practice we can talk about as building discipline as building structure of regulating ourselves, and then we also have about expressing ourselves, and this just tends to be underdone in yoga or following the natural process of the body authentic movement capoeira for rhythm systema have much more of that than the average modern posture yoga class so the freedom side or we could call it process work uh, and i mentioned this in some of the podcast that's really really critical as well um as i said people even have almost have a political bias towards this so that that's worth looking at in your practice is it more form-based which will build certain skills or more freedom-based more expressive which will build other skills and you know, one can make you a bit uptight and the other can make you a bit unboundaried. So it's worth having some balance between those two things. I remember when I discovered uh, uh, Fire Rhythms, it was like, wow, you know, listen to Adam's podcast. And that. all of a sudden it was like freedom and movement. I could do whatever. Yeah. All right. So um, the main perspective I'm interested in is embodiment. So this is the key part, really, of this taking me a while to get there. I appreciate this is how we get yoga off the mat. So the the embodied perspective, it says that in a class, you're building a way of being. So, you, you, yes, you're learning skills, but you're, it's much deeper than that. This uh, Obviously, this podcast all about this perspective. This is what Embodied Yoga Principles is all about, that you're learning a way of being. It's, in, it's awareness-based, yes, but you're working on yourself through the body. So, it's not just mindfulness. You're actually developing yourself um, through this awareness-based practice, through what you're embodying. You know, it's like, what is the yoga you're doing? Uh, look at the, um, listen to the episode on practice. What is the episode, what is the uh, practice, the body you're building? You know, I sometimes give this example of I was in a, um, went to a major London yoga studio and I did a, I think it was like a hardcore Ashtangri type class and, and definitely a yin class. And I was in, did one after the other. And I remember thinking the wrong people were in the classes. You know, the super yang people were turning up and going, right, I'm going to do this for the for the yang class. And the super yin people kind of softly floated in and connected with, the, with each other for the yin class. And I thought, you guys are kind of in the wrong place here. Yeah, you're learning the wrong skill. Uh, you're building, the, you're embodying the wrong thing in terms of you're maybe just deepening your neurosis and not actually building your range, building your choices that you can have. So this is the key embodied perspective. Like what does your yoga build and I think that's um, worth focusing on, you know, like the asking yourself that question, what does your yoga build? 
Uh, and EYP, we have specific postures, so um, people can actually be much more specific and say, right, I'm working on vulnerability, or I'm working on, you know, Warrior 2, you probably know, or there um you know i actually asked my wife i said like which postures should i practice and she was like openness vulnerability letting go and i forget the other one yes posture that was it and she's like she just told me like these are what you need to practice and i was like all right thanks for your feedback and i inputted that into what i'd been reflecting on and what my mentor told me uh in terms of what might be a useful practice for me so um yeah being able to work on your embodiment in class and that's the type of yoga you do but it's also how you do it so the manner with which you do your yoga, you know, you could do a, a, even a very yin yoga in a very like driving, pushing, right? I'm going to do hang in there for the yin postures as much as possible. I'm going to be the best at yin yoga. I'm going to yin the shit out of it. And that takes away the point, right? Embodiment in a way can be defined as how we are, or the manner with which we do things. So um, it's kind of not only is it ironic, but it, it, it undermines the whole practice if you do that. All right. The next section is on ethics. Major aspect of transformative practice major part of our life our morality is kind of an old-fashioned word our values perhaps a more acceptable word it's it's always been considered part of any transformative effort sadly it's often taken out so people practice mindfulness without the ethics now for example it'd be like mindfulness of being a sniper or something uh, which is actually a real thing by the way that one um there's a culture which sells uh, a lack of restraint and it confuses that with freedom um ethics can even look kind of old-fashioned um, obviously, there's eight limbs. Patanjali's yoga had, had uh, you know, the yamas and niyamas in. In Buddhism, there's a whole chunk of the eightfold path. Several sections are based to ethics. Um, you know, like, where do they fit into your yoga? And the most basic question can be, am I practicing my yoga in a way I'd like to live? That's an embodiment question, but also an ethics question. Um, you know, do you have communities of support and accountability who will challenge you around that? Like, you know, in EYP, we have, like, a teacher's group who can challenge me if I do anything unethical. You know, the question becomes, how do we practice ethics? And the first one is practicing ethics on the mat. So like making your own practice kind, for example. I practice I found myself being unkind to myself. Um, you know, is, is it honest? You know, what do I, you know, have to be a little creative here, but you can see that, let's say I'm doing a twist and I'm kind of going way out of my center in it and leaning to one side. There's a dishonesty to that. Yeah, there's an honesty to picking the variation that's going to be most helpful. You can link ethics to asana in this way. Uh, you know, it's, uh, are you using, uh, let's have a look at another one. Oh, working with desire and I've got to get it. You know, what's my target? That's another one. Um, is there pride and shame? You know, like looking at the ethics around that when I do a tree posture or show off in that way. Um, I think a key thing in terms of ethics is empowerment. So for me, I want students to make their own choices, to respect their boundaries. So I'm implicitly teaching ethics through all of that stuff, a lot of which we've talked about before. It's a kind of fundamental life frame that I think doesn't fit the standard guru model. Um, and, I, and I think those guru systems, you know, there's so much abuse and it's not just the occasional case. It's almost inevitable because of, without the checks and balances, because of that disempowerment that's fundamentally there, which says, I know better than you do about your body. That's fundamentally teaching something unethical uh, right at the heart. Yeah, um, Embodiment obviously helps. So we're, we're subjectifying rather than objectifying ourselves and our students, um, You know, putting us in touch with ourselves so we can actually feel our values. There's, there's, there is that sense of right and wrong within the body, our sense of ethics, live with us, live, listen to Paul Linden's uh, podcast if you want more on that. Um, you know, having an intention towards service, I think is a big deal. Starting a class with like, right, this is the traditional Buddhist would be like, this is for the benefit of all sentient beings. It's a, that to me is a little full on for a modern context, but you know, having I say at the beginning of a personal growth uh, workshop or a yoga class, have some intention to make this of use to the world, to, to be have this a positive intention to be useful for other people. That actually changes it uh, quite significantly. And I already mentioned the yoga sandwich as a way to look at your ethics before and after class. The thing with ethics is it comes out with other people. Ethics is about interaction. So if you if there's no interaction in a yoga class it's very difficult to explore ethics. Yeah, you can do it, you know, am I being honest in this pose or whatever? Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's also like the big taboos that are taken out of yoga. So sexuality is often taken out. So how do we develop ethics around that? You know, um, sometimes for me, it's about restraint. I remember one yoga class in Stockholm, I put my mat down, I was in the middle of the room and I just got surrounded by the most beautiful women and I just went, you know what, my, my practice is not going to be looking at them this class, those sneaky looks or, you know, I'm not, I wasn't going to like perv them or anything, but you know, certainly it's possible to be 
uh, in that mode. And I decided that restraint was my practice. And another practice might be to sort of feel that, like, wow, I'm surrounded by these amazing women. That's beautiful. And notice that feeling in my body without fantasizing and just kind of being present with that. You know, that might be another practice. Um, obviously, social opportunities do come up uh, in yoga context. So we get a, a place to play with that. You know, I've been less than perfect at yoga com- uh, yoga uh, festivals in the past before you know um i have pretty strict ethics with my students though so um you know there is a code of conduct uh, in the EYP teachers which is just don't shag your students that's uh, part of our ethical kind of code um it's an absolute uh, because we're doing transformative kind of work i've seen teachers that question that i find it very odd i think you know you're interfering it's bad for you it's bad for them it's bad for everyone um not helpful money is another taboo and I'd say almost bigger than sex in yoga circles that actually addressing that taboo, that shadow around money, noticing how you are when you pay your 10 pounds at the beginning of class, uh, you know, you breathing when you do that, you can bring awareness to that the same as anything. I work with three uh, with P postures about giving, uh, caring for and letting go of being generous, uh, roughly equating to uh, the three major Hindu deities, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, if you want to get esoteric about it. Um, but we actually have postures to work with generosity and receiving. Um, so I think that's, you know, money side's well worth exploring. And you can Google a video on the yoga of money, put that into YouTube, yoga of money, Mark Walsh. Um, you know, death is kind of addressed a little bit as a taboo. It's another one I like to play with a little bit more. We tend to do Shavasana as a deaf meditation in EYP. Um, so there's some taboos and things that impact on ethics that are worth looking at. Okay, next big area. So yoga can be used as a way of getting uh, getting insights about yourself. So this is the basic EYP method. It can be used as an inquiry process. Um, so most medium to long-term yoga people have come across this. I think the only difference is we really focus on it in EYP. There's three basic kind of uh, inquiries you can do. This is the EYP method. Please quote me. Please mention me if you're doing this. I think it's pretty uh, unique to have systematized it like this. We have familiarity, deviation, and application. So familiarity is where you're in a posture and you ask yourself, does this feel familiar? Do I feel at home in this posture? You know, I sometimes joke the first time I did a warrior two posture, I was like, thank fuck, a posture that they've got right, one that I like. And of course, it was no more right than a forward bend. I just felt more familiar because of my personality. It was revealing patterns. Um, Patterns are also revealed through deviation. So how do you do the posture? You know, you can see a video on no posture, put in no posture EYP into YouTube. And you'll see there's like 15 different deviations that people can do. And they don't just do it wrong. They do it them so what I mean by that is the open people tend to have normally the hands kind of in front of the heart in the posture. It's like a stop signal. Uh, and often more open people will have it to the left to be way open and the more defensive people will be more closed. Uh, some people don't face people doing it. Some people have it very aggressive in it. Some people are pushy or push over. And you see all those patterns and they really correlate with how people are off the mat to the point of view that it's quite exposing for people. Um, Jim Taran, one of my yoga teachers, calls that exposure in yoga. Um, and the third one, the application, you can actually turn any yoga posture into like a life coaching uh, inquiry, where let's say you're doing the no posture, or the warrior posture, or the letting go, the four bend, and you say, where do I need to do this in your life? This is a very easy way of accessing the wisdom of the body things come up not every time and even if it doesn't you're still doing the embodiment part right you're still marinating yourself in the embodiment of the posture uh but to actually uh, uh ask oneself and it's very interesting th- very profound things come very quickly when people start doing these you know um different things come up you can Another aspect of familiarity is comparison, like comparing two different postures, feeling which is most familiar. So I should mention that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. You'll see in the book examples and pictures. So you have a look at the book if you want to see. It's probably easier. Some of the deviation stuff is easier to show either on video or on pictures than to tell. So uh, it's worth looking at that. And the the application process, you know, this is something, you know, if you want to steal this, you can, again, please mention me, but you can put it in your classes. Just when people are having doing warrior posture, you can just say, is that familiar? That's the familiarity. And then the application, the application inquiry, like where do you need to be more of a warrior in your life? Where at work, where in your romantic relationships, where have your children? They're the big three for most people. If you don't have kids, it's just two. The big areas that most people are interested in. Uh, what kind of warrior do you need to be? You can actually get people creative and to make their own inquiries with it. How would that posture look like for you? Yeah. Um, so they're the big ones. Just a word of caution there. I would say that 
these processes can bring things up relatively quickly. I was a bit amazed online actually yesterday. I shared a video of one of my postures and someone said, oh, this is great. I'm going to do it tomorrow. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just watched the three minute video. You might want to be a bit careful because I've, you know, I've seen, I've done something around no posture, for example, and then someone's run out in tears and I, you know, I found them and they've said, you know, I said, what happened? And they've said, you know, I was raped. It brought up stuff about not saying no. And I'm like, whoa, okay. And, you know, I have enough psychological training and, and maturity to be able to sit with them and empathize and give them the number of a therapist that I know and say, look, you know, I'm not a therapist, but here's someone I really recommend to say, you know, I can put you in touch with other people that have been through this issue, this support groups. That's the kind of thing that can come up when you're doing embodied yoga. It can be, and I use that as a fairly extreme example because it's, it's, it's happened twice, actually, that example with no posture over the years. Uh, and it shows people the kind of stuff that can come up. It's worth getting some basic trauma training as well. Um, obviously, there's uh, the Boston group in America that do this, Sarah Holmes de Castro, Sarah Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S-D-E-C-A-S-T-R-O. She's in Brighton and also Canada. Uh, her courses are very good. I can personally recommend. And I've got a little video called Trauma Intro for Yoga Teachers. Put Trauma Education for Yoga Teachers into YouTube. A little bit of trauma training, I think, is good if you're starting to do this um, psychological work, as it were. Okay, uh, a little bit more on processing and social witnessing. So I've kind of pointed to this already. Uh, in yoga class, it's often moving a bit quick and just having the time to catch these patterns, to get these insights about yourself, a little bit of stopping and slowing down is really helpful. Um, you know, in, in, in a fast vinyasa class, it can be a bit difficult unless you're very skilled to see these patterns at work. Um, so I like to give periods of sort of stillness and silence and, you know, have people to have a quick shavasana. Certainly wouldn't talk as much as I have on this podcast. I'm hoping you're putting your own pauses in with the pause button. Um, brief fly downs, brief walking around the room is a good way of helping people process things emotionally or free structure, free practice without structure, asking people to make noises, having regular breaks. You know, I find an hour and a half is the absolute maximum people can do in transformative work. Maybe two hours, usually an hour and a half. I'm going to end this podcast under an hour and a half to practice what I teach there. And a key one here is verbal debrief. So people need to speak about their things quite often to clarify them, their insights, and also to be witnessed. Yeah, there's power in that social witnessing. Um, so to avoid it getting too heady, what we do in EYP is we have these fairly frequent one-minute check-ins. And I might say, okay, find a partner, center yourself, close your eyes, feel your own body, open your eyes, look at the partner. We have a very set form for it. And then I'll say a very specific question like, where do you need more no or more yes in your life? Or where do you need to be more of a warrior in your life? One specific question, and then you get one minute total. And that's actually enough time to clarify your thought less is actually more conciseness creates clarity it's one of our sayings and also to be witnessed in that so it kind of sinks in and there's a way in which learning can kind of sink in and also we're practicing that skill of uh, expressing uh, honestly directly authentically and listening with empathy without interrupting so they're key life skills uh, to to incorporate so i'd say like you know allowing some time to process stuff that comes up in yoga if it's physically through walking or dancing or stretching or just lying down like you know in feldenkrais they give you a, a a one minute lying down break every 10 minutes just the process yeah feldenkrais is a beautiful somatic practice if you've not come across it um so yeah that's the integration side of things and i think without that integration insights get missed and it can be difficult to transfer things off the mat uh, the other thing for getting things off the mat and i think this is one of our i've only come across one person who says they do this in new zealand and i haven't really seen them do it i think it's pretty unique it's micro postures so micro postures are the small state change version of a macro posture so you know as i pointed to before you can't just pull a cheeky warrior two pose in the middle of a board meeting or in the middle of a delicate conversation with your kids or husband but what you can do is step forward slightly extend your fingers and do like a mini version of the posture again you might want to look at the video put in micro postures and eyp into youtube to see some of these examples uh, the the ebook has uh, various uh, links in for this um yeah so um yeah these micro postures are a great way of getting yoga off the mat because essentially i have almost jungian view of yoga that the shapes are archetypal 
Um, and we can trigger these shapes by doing this small version of them. So it's like we invest in the shape by doing it in the big way, in the archetypal form. You know, warrior is called warrior, not child for a reason. Warrior and child posture are very different. They bring out very different qualities. And then we can just touch upon those. And again, look at the videos if you want, or just experiment with this. Like what is a very small, non-weird looking, you know, that's my criteria for micro posture, it has to be non-weird looking version of all of these. It enables us to shift into them and even as i sit here uh recording this i can shift into any of the the postures by how i sit but using my hand position my eyes kind of subtle things that if you were just like chatting to me over a table you might not uh even notice mm. so oh, there's so much more good stuff here i want to say it's really hard to skip some of this this is i really love this content this has like been my life's work for a few for a few years i've been really focusing my work on on getting yoga off the mat and making yoga more deep and meaningful for people and we can consistently do that with these methods now it's really consistent most of the teachers I've, I've trained and probably done this in about 15 different countries now with very senior teachers and even people that don't like me personally are impressed with the method the method really works so um yeah give some of this stuff a try and, and come to our workshops if you, if you don't mind a plug uh that's uh, well worth a look in person some of this stuff's best taught practically and some of it's really simple here's what you can take away we are we ask um participants to say do yoga like your life is and some of them might do it in a controlled way or a manic way or a playful way. And then I'll say, okay, do yoga how you would like your life to be. Inquiries like that. We have loads of inquiries, like bigger inquiries. Uh, we're also working with standing, walking and sitting. So the Buddha said that, you know, meditation should be practicing those four positions, sitting, standing, walking. Often yoga is done either just standing or just sitting. And by taking postures into walking, the quality of the postures into walking, or the quality of the postures into sitting and again, there's videos on that online. Uh, the, the, if, if, if you're into yoga and getting yoga off the map, make sure you subscribe to that YouTube channel. It's called Yoga for Your Whole Life. You'll easily find it. It's not the main embodied yoga, embodiment channel that I have. It's a separate channel, a smaller channel. Um, yoga videos every week on there. But it's much easier to get this stuff into your life if you can practice it sitting and walking. So I, just, I spend most of my days sitting and walking, not in a chair, I mean, where I say sitting. Yeah. So it's, practicing chair yoga can be really helpful for this. Like, what does your warrior posture look like in a chair? the macro form but then the micro form yeah because that's how i spend most of my day sitting in a chair and walking around you know a bit of standing not so much a bit of lying down not so much so i think it's really important to do that i mentioned relational practices um you know i think this is such an important part of life that you can't stop this in a way in a yoga class like people are always aware of the other people around them if they even if they're trying not to be in this normal firm container people are aware of authority you know do they listen to you are they passively aggressively uh, not doing what you're saying are they actually making choices to not do what you're saying in a kind of more healthy way you know are they critical or, or com making comparisons with other people or feeling shame because they fall over in tree posture and they're supposed to be a yoga teacher this kind of social dynamics is always going on in yoga and i think it's well worth tracking um we've got like a whole load of paired practices in yoga I'll give an example of a simple one so i've been talking about warrior two get someone to do warrior two side by side i remember the first time i did this with my friend vidyadasa it was just so romantic it was unbelievable it was just like oh my god i love you we're like partners we're friends it's just the best thing for us and other people i don't want to do that with and that's interesting um or you know doing it competitively dare i say look up yoga competitions that's a whole area of life which is not explored it's part of life it can be explored through yoga and it can be explored with sensitivity and mindfulness rather than in a crass way if you're shocked by the idea of a yoga competition look up our video on that look what we're doing on yoga competitions you can totally explore it you know um or have someone hold your arms as you're doing warrior posture so standing behind you putting a palm under each elbow supporting you a little bit and i i've seen some profound realizations people do that and that oh my god do i need support or it might be like get off me i really don't need support right now i'm really wanting independence right now yeah uh, when we do postures around authority or around giving, we've got EYP postures for those. Uh, we, uh, you know, I've done that with people in relationships. I've done that with people that run a business together and the patterns that come out or oh, what you want to practice. You know, that's the basic embodiment thing. What are the patterns? What is there? And then what do you want to build? What do you want to grow into? And that can be, should be done relationally, I would say, to really get it off the mat as well as, um, uh, yeah, as well as more, um, uh, in so solo practice Whew. noticing I'm a little bit talked out and tired as we come towards the end here so I hope this is 
coherent, uh, lots of cooperative practices and the competitive practices. These are two sides of life. Like the tree off is a good competitive practice or the plank off as a way of building awareness, not a way of sort of self aggrandizing. Yeah. Um, this is acro yoga. There's loads you can explore for there from a cooperative point of view. You know, you're looking at things like trust and safety and connection. These are core issues, core issues to look at. Right. Okay. Hmm. There's some more stuff in the book on technology and music and on being attractive and uh, working with purpose. Uh, but I think I've said more than enough. I want to wrap this up. I'm going to a, a course with Amy Matthews in Cambridge today of, uh, of Embodied Yoga uh, Anatomy. Looking forward to that. Not met her before, so looking forward to that. So I'm going to need to get out the door for that. Um, yeah, have a look at the ebook if this was useful. Discuss things on the, on, on the ebook's also got pictures of sort of art in using these archetypal postures as well. That's worth a look. Um, yeah, have a look at this. Discuss it on the Facebook group. I hope there's been something useful here. And come to EYP, particularly the Embodied Yoga principles training to trainers all over the world have a look at the website and you'll get the free ebook if you want to look at that so um, this partly been a plug for eyp so i hope you don't mind that but it, it's also just i think super useful content um you know even if you never pay me a penny in your life there's just loads of good stuff here that i hope you I hope you put to good use so uh, good luck with that if you enjoyed this episode subscribe to get more if you'd like to help us build the embodied tribe leave a review on itunes or share this on your social media if you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body. <laughs>